Okay. So as you were setting up the story, you were saying that this is part of a big world. You write in one big world. Mm -hmm. So I'm very intrigued by that. How do you keep track of your world building? Let me preface this by saying that I did not go into writing with a plan. I did it with no forethought, which is extremely atypical of me. I like to have an idea of where things are going and why I'm doing them. But I had an idea for his Highland Lass and I decided on a whim to write the story. And so I had, you know, kind of some thoughts about a series of this young woman who's the youngest of five kids and that, you know, her four older brothers would have their stories too. And then I did a prequel for their parents, which is where you initially meet Hamish. And from there, it just kind of kept going. So when I finished that series, I actually went to write a Viking series. So as I worked through my series, you know, I wanted this big world. So the, the Vikings kind of went to the side for a little bit. And the Highland Ladies was the direct spinoff of the Clan Sinclair. The, the heroine in the first book, a spinster at the Highland Court, makes appearances in the last two books about the brothers in the Clan Sinclair. And so it just kind of went from there. And then, you know, I had in the Clan Sinclair, I had said that Kyla was a Sutherland and that she was Hamish's younger sister. So in the clans in, or in the Highland Ladies, I took Hamish's children, two daughters and a son, and they got their own books. And so it just kept building and building. And then when I finished that, I went to the Clan Sinclair Legacy. And in the very first book, Highland Lion, I tie it back to the Viking series. So the two main characters, the hero and the heroine, are each descendants of characters from that series that were already closely blended as as family and friends. So I, I looped it back together. And then now, you know, House of Clan Sutherland is another second generation that is an offshoot and runs parallel in timeline to the Clan Sinclair legacy. So truly, I kept it all in the family. And, you know, there's so many clans in Scotland during that time, that it's not that difficult to pair people off. And as you know, the Clan Sinclair legacy showed and I paired up, you know, a, a couple of characters that were the offspring of, of the Clan Sinclair and the Highland Ladies. I'm going to continue to do that because readers said, what's going to happen to these couples now that you're done with these stories? And I said, oh, don't you worry. I got lots <laughs> more stories to tell. So the couples from the Highland Ladies and the Highland Ladies always, well, their children will start to blend in with the Sutherland grandkids and the Clan Sinclair grandkids. So yeah. it's said one big world. And it's easy for me to do because I've set it in a specific region of the Highlands. I've picked a time that is super rich in adversity and conflict. There's lots and lots of historical fodder for conflicts between the clans. And so it just, it makes it easy for me to build that world because there's so much historical stuff in that I can use to, to wrap into it. Yeah. And so how do you incorporate the research part into the creative writing part? Do you do the research first and then write, or is it kind of throughout the process? So my mother is English and I spent a lot of time in England as a child and read a lot of history books about England. And as we know, history is written by the victors. So <laughs> when I started reading or started writing Scottish Highlanders, I had to reframe my knowledge to a different perspective and take the opposite side. And now I'm like, those dastardly English, <laughs> stay off our land. You, you know, can't take away my freedom. So <laughs> There, I came to it with a lot of knowledge. Plus, I had been an advanced placement European history teacher, which if you're not American, is a secondary school course that is taught at a college level. So I brought in a lot of knowledge already. And then when I pick which two clans I want to pair up, I research, you know, who were their allies? Who were their enemies? 
what things were going on, you know, within 200 years, if I'm really pushing it, of those dates, usually within maybe a hundred at most, that I can use as catalysts. And so I do research as need be, but you know, I am not writing textbooks anymore. So I'm not looking to regurgitate every fact I find. I take it as a holistic approach and figure out what I can weave in. And some of it never gets explicitly stated, but it has enhanced my understanding in order to, to bring that bigger picture into the story. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate. I have the memory of a steel trap, you know, <laughs> a memory of an elephant, at least for the things that matter to me. So I can recall a lot of the history. Can't always recall the eye color of characters from like 20 books ago. Yeah. Or the, <laughs> but I can remember a lot of the historical facts. Yeah. So I was going to ask nitty gritty wise, especially with the world building, do you have a series Bible where you keep track of the characters and their characteristics and all of that? I do. So I use a program called Plotter and I am not a plotter when it comes to fiction. I don't plan out very closely what's going to happen. I am a a pantser or a plotty pantser. A, <laughs> what is it? A discovery author. There's any number of names for us, but basically we'll see where the story takes me. So, you know, I do have to keep track of that. Between my historical and my contemporary, I've written... 55 and a quarter books at this point, like I have, you know, that's over a hundred main characters, never mind all the secondaries. So I do have to, to take notes to keep track. So I use this program plotter as my story Bible. So rather than as its name tells you, I don't use it for plotting, but it has features that are really great for me to keep track of everything. And then I wrote the Highland Ladies Guide, which goes as a reader guide to the Highland Ladies and the Highland Ladies always. And so that gives readers insights into the different characters and the setting and the history and things like that, because it is a long, it was 15 books originally, and I split it in half. So the Highland Ladies was 15. Now it's the Highland Ladies is eight and the Highland Ladies always is seven. But that companion guide helps because there's a lot of people to keep track of. There's a lot of history to keep track of. There's a lot of locations to keep track mm -hmm. of. And it helped me as well. <laughs> so yeah. I wrote this companion book for other people, but it became my my well-documented series Bible. So it was a, a blessing in disguise to do that. That's cool. I do have an excellent memory, but I had over 300 characters at this no, point. Oh, yeah. All those books. I can't remember all of them. Yeah. And so you said you've written 55 books. Would you say, have you, how do you think your writing has transformed, grown, or changed since your first book? It definitely has. I think the fluidity and cadence of my writing has improved a little bit. You know, with that first book, because I didn't have a plan and I didn't know where I was going with this, I wasn't really sure how much to put into it. I wasn't sure if I should go further in some parts and less in others. I didn't have my feet under me, despite the hundreds of historical romance books I had already read. It's different when you're writing them yourself. So I've just kind of grown into that and I feel more comfortable where to develop the story arc and, and things along those lines. I think the complexity of the storylines has grown as I became more comfortable with the storytelling, but at the heart of it, no matter what book you read, whether it's his Highland Lass, my very first book, or, you know, one of my mafia ones, or Highland Love Comes Calling, you will always find the same core themes. It will always be family is the hub, whether it's by blood or by choice. And then loyalty, honor, duty, and love are the ones that are the spokes off of that. So that has never, ever changed. That will always, because that's just intuitively what I value, mm -hmm. that will always be the same. That will never change unless, you know, I write something monumentally different. It's really interesting to think about how 
inevitably we change because we're people who are growing, but then there are also these themes that are just going to continue to show up because we're interested in them. We value them. We're obsessed with them. Those were themes that I didn't intentionally start out with. It took a little reflection to realize, oh, these keep coming up over and over again. This must be, you know, what I value in my storytelling. They're things that are really important to me in real life. So it shouldn't be shocking that they play out in my stories, but I did not go into writing with those as, you know, things that I intended to work into it. It was more of a, a revelation, if you will. Yeah. The, the writing tells on us. 